Amen. Well, I love to praise him. 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 I love to. Oh, you know that I love to praise him. A holy name. Well, I love to praise him. I love to praise him. Well, I love to praise him. Oh, you know that I love to praise him. A holy name because of he's my rock. Oh, my rock, oh, my rock, my soul. And, and he's just a wheel. Uh, just a turning in the middle, lover, and I know he'll never, he won't never, won't never let me. Uh, he just a Jew, that I, that I have. Keep singing hallelujah, a hallelujah, oh Lord, I love the Oh, we're singing hallelujah, a hallelujah. Oh, Lord, I love to keep singing hallelujah, a hallelujah. Oh, Lord, I love to. Oh, you know that I love to praise you, a holy name, because of you, my rock. Oh, uh, my rock, uh, my rock, my soul, and uh, he's just a wheel. Uh, just a turning in the middle of love. And I know he'll never, he won't never, won't never let me. Uh, he's just a Jew that I, that I have. Keep singing hallelujah, hallelujah, oh Lord, I love the Oh, we're singing hallelujah, hallelujah, oh Lord, I love the Keep singing hallelujah, hallelujah, oh Lord, I love the Oh, you know that I love to praise him, a holy name. Let the church say amen. amen. Let the church say amen again. Yes, amen. God is good how often? All the time. And all the time. God is good. Find somebody close to you and say, neighbor, neighbor. God, loves God loves you. And I do too. And, I do. and if you love, me, you love me as much as I love you, then nothing can break. I love him too. Amen, amen, amen. Surely it is just once more and again that our Heavenly Father has decided to smile upon us on this morning. I know you think you're doing all right and that you're pretty good, but I want to let you know that none of us here today are deserving of the goodness of God. All of us deserve for God to have done away with us a long time ago. But I'm just so glad that I serve a God not of a second chance, not of a third, not a fourth, not even a hundred, but a God of another chance. Because truth be told, we ain't always been good. And truth be told, we ain't halfway good right now. And we're standing in the need of mercy. We're standing in the need of grace and the love that can only come from our Father in heaven. Amen. It's good to see y'all this morning. It's good to see you. I'm glad to be here. I'm with you all um, on this morning. And um, pray for us as we come here this morning. And we'll be leaving here on this afternoon, headed out to Texas. 
out to um, Terrell, Texas for the lectureship out there. I'll be preaching out there this week, so keep us in your prayers. Yeah, y'all, 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 came to, y'all came to give God some praise this morning? Y'all, now, 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 I know I didn't come to a funeral this morning. I came to a place with some people that know the Lord for themselves. This ain't your first go around with the Lord. You got some history with God in your life right now. You've seen God bring you through hills, valleys, and mountains. You got a reason to give God praise this morning. You ain't Ain't looking for nobody to give you no Q, give me a G, give me a O, give me a D. What does that spell? But you woke up this morning with your mind stayed on Jesus. Lord, I thank you for bringing me through another week. Danger seen and unseen, protecting me, keeping my mind, keeping my family, keeping my sanity. Lord, five or ten times I wanted to go out, but you held my tongue. Lord, I thank you. And he's worthy of the praise on this morning. He's worthy of the praise on this morning. Follow me, follow me, if you will, this morning to the book of Luke. The book of Luke chapter number two. The book of Luke chapter number two. And we're going to begin at at verse number one. Now, reading this, I want to let you know this ain't a Christmas message. I want to let you know this ain't a Christmas message. I know you was thinking that preacher. You ain't even let Thanksgiving go by yet. You already, already talking about Christmas. I know, I know. But what I love about God's word so much is that every time you go to his word, you find something new that you didn't find out. Any, any of y'all ever experienced that before? Every time you go back to the word of God, you say, that, man, well, I didn't notice that the last time. And let me tell you, the word of God is so fresh and it's so, so, so refreshing to you every time you come back. Let me tell you, I don't care what it is that you're dealing with in this life. You can go to the word of God and you can find some comfort to be able to make it through. Well, hey, anybody ever experienced that in your life where you were down on your luck, feeling sad, down? dejected and depressed and you went to the word of God and you found the strength that you needed to go on a little bit further in Jesus you can find that strength so I pray on this morning that you'll find some strength for your journey on this morning because truth be told we get a little weary every now and then and and, and, and let me tell you because our adversary he's relentless in what he does he's on his job on a daily basis and if he don't get you today let guess what he'll be waiting on you at your job in the morning He'll get you at your job tomorrow. Guess what? He'll be waiting on you somewhere on Tuesday. He is a relentless foe. He is a relentless adversary. And I want to let you know, on your own, you can't fight the devil. You need something to do battle with the enemy with. And you remember when our master was out in the wilderness and the enemy came to tempt him to sin? You remember he came and he said, if you be the son of God. Now, that's the, that's the first mess up right there. Dev, you knew who I was from the beginning. You ain't just not me, me. You come in contact with me before. If you be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. It is written. And you notice every time the enemy came to Jesus to tempt him, he had a it is written on the inside of him so that he can come back what it was that the devil was trying to throw at him. Well, child of God, for you today, if you expect to come back the fiery darts of the devil that are coming your way, you are going to have to have a God said on the inside of you. I'm talking about picking up your Bible, not just on Sunday morning. I'm talking about where the word of God, where David said, Thy word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against thee. You have to have a healthy diet of the word of God in your life. So therefore, when the adversary does come to tempt you, it is written. It is written. It is written. Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, Luke chapter 2, beginning at verse number 1. The grass withers and the flower thereof shall fade away. But the word of our God shall stand forever, shall stand forever. And in case y'all didn't know, we're getting ready for the final countdown. Amen. We're getting ready for the final countdown. Amen. 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 Luke chapter two, beginning at verse number one. You got it? See, I got it. Amen. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that the whole empire should be registered. The first registration took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. So everyone went to be registered, each to his own town. Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family line of David, to be registered among the line of Mary, who was engaged to him and was pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth, Then she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him tightly in cloth and laid him in a manger 
because there was no guest room available. Amen. If you would pray with me. Spirit of the living God, we thank you on this morning. Father, we thank you for just another opportunity that we have to come and feast at the table of your word. Father, now I ask that you would anoint these lips of clay. Hide me behind your glorious cross that no flesh would take any glory in what you ought to receive. And Father, if you grant us these petitions and prayers, we'll be so ever mindful to give your name the praise, the glory, and the honor of which you are so deserving. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Let somebody say amen. amen. I want to know, I, I want to know, is there, is there anybody here this morning that has ever faced a night season in your life? I want to know, has, is there anybody here this morning that has ever experienced a series of night seasons in your life? Where it seems like I got out of this yesterday and now I'm having to go through this today. But what worked for me yesterday is not working for me today. So now, like the man who had a son that was having convulsions, Lord, I believe. But at the same time, I'm having some unbelief. How is it that I believe, but at the same time, I unbelieve? Because even though I believe still because of certain situations and circumstances that arise in my life, because things don't work out the way that I think they ought to work out. Now I'm looking at God cross-eyed like, God, where are you? Is, is, this really going, is this really going to work for me? And you find yourself during the night seasons of your life asking this question, Lord, where are you? Yeah, yeah. Lord, do you see what I'm going through? Yeah, yeah. Right. Do you see what I'm dealing with? You said in your word that you would never put more on me than I am able to bear. You said in your word that I would be with you always, even until the end of the earth. You said, if I make my bed in hell, behold thou art there. If I spread out my wings like an eagle and rise up, Lord, behold thou art there. You said all of that. But Lord, with what I'm dealing with right now, I just don't see it. You ever been there before? You ever, you ever been there where you've had to say, Lord, I don't know what you're going to do, but you got to do something right now. But I want to encourage you this morning. Because when you experience those moments in your life, how we so soon forget who delivered us out of the last trouble. How, how we so soon forget who was there with us in our yesterday. How we, how we so soon forget that the last time that we was down on our luck, who it was that delivered us and who it was that sustained us and brought us out right in the nick of time. So, so I, I, I want to encourage somebody this morning, look at, look at somebody and tell them, he was the same God yesterday. That's our message this morning. He was the same God yesterday. I wonder, I wonder, I wonder how your life would change if everywhere you had to go, you had to walk to get there. Imagine, imagine how much further it would take you to go a simple distance such as Orlando. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, that would be a once in a lifetime trip. I mean, you wouldn't be walking to Orlando two, three, four times out of the year. I mean, that would be something that you did once out of the year if you had to walk to get there. You couldn't imagine going two, three, four times a year. Ooh, uh, you, you better wait till next year we can go to Walt Disney World. We ain't going this year. I don't, I don't feel like walking that far. And you might go once in a lifetime, but imagine how many stops you would have to make along the way. If you and your family got ready to go to Orlando and had to travel by a donkey, how long would it take you to get there? So then, it's not how far you have to go to your destination, but it's the circumstances that you have to travel with to get to your destination. Sometimes, children of God, we are very close to where it is that we would like to be, closer than we actually think. 
closer than we could have ever imagined, closer than we would have believed is possible. And let me tell you something, I don't care what you think, the devil can't change the distance of where you are this morning. What do you mean, preacher? It, it is as close as it is when you're close, the devil can't stop you from being close to where God wants you to be. And, and the spirit will let you know when you, I mean, because sometimes you have to encourage yourself in the midst of your night season and say, I'm nearer to my salvation than I've ever been. I'm closer now than I've ever been in my life. I know that this setback is just another opportunity for God to show up and show out in my life. I'm closer right now. I'm almost there. I just got to keep pushing, persevering. Sooner or later, I will arrive at my destination. I can't give up. I can't give out. I got to hold on. The blessing is close. The blessing is close. I'm on the verge. I'm on the edge. I'm about to step in. It's not the distance because the enemy can't change your distance. But sometimes we feel like he's moving the goal just a little bit further back to where we're almost there. And he just takes the entire goal post and just moves it back and say, OK, now keep on coming. The fact the Bible says that forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that are before. We press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God. It's marked. It is where it is, and the devil can't move it back. But it does feel like that sometimes. It feels like every time you're on the verge of finally getting your hands around the thing that you believe God to do, the devil say, uh-uh, you thought you had it. Move it back just a little bit. Now keep on coming. I'm going to move it back just a little bit more. He can't move it back. He can't move it back. In fact, it really wasn't that far from Egypt to the promised land. It wasn't far at all. It should have taken about three days for them to get to where they were going. It ended up being 40 years. Isn't it amazing how something that should have happened quick can take a long time for it to take place? It's not like they kept moving the promised land. Okay, y'all almost there. We're going to move it back just a little bit. Uh-uh. You're almost there yet for 40 years. It was always where it was supposed to be. The enemy cannot change the destination, but oh, how he can work with the circumstances of your life. The circumstances by where we travel is what causes our faith to be significant. That's not the distance. You're always close to where God went. If you're holding on to God, you're always close to a blessing. Now, if I had one witness right here, if you believe, I don't know about you, but I live under an open heaven. I live, my mindset is like one of those movies where you get at the end and it says, stay tuned. You don't know what's coming next, but you know you got to wait on it. And as a child of God, you ought to live on a stay tuned, I can't wait. Hold on just a minute. I know this setup is just another opportunity for God to come and show out in my life. I don't know where it's coming from. I don't know what God's going to do, but child of God, something coming from somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so it wasn't the, the distance, but then when you think about the things that happen along the way, I'm learning that it's not even about the destination most times in life. The destination ain't always even that important. The destination is present. It is there. It is precast, already set into play, predetermined by God. These shall be mine. That boy right there, the one that's strung out on drugs, that's going to be my next deacon. The one that's out there parlaying all night, that's going to be my next preacher. The one that they've lied on, dejected, and outcast, said that they will never amount to anything. God said, that's the one that I've chosen to do a great work for me. God got a purpose for your life. That one right there, that one, that one right there. I have determined, I have chosen them. The destination is set. It's not about the destination. It's about the things that happen along the way. The problem with most of us when we read the Bible is said that we're reading from the other side of the story. We're reading about Jesus and Mary and Joseph 2,000 years later. We know how the story ends, and we know every, how everything works out okay. We also know who he is to us, everything. But imagine if you were Joseph, and you had found this beautiful young lady that you've been seeing for some time, and you have announced to all of her friends, that's going to be my bride. And you had begun to set into place the things that were necessary to endow her and to give her a dowry and to honor her. 
and to recognize her. But before you can get to the wedding, she started picking up a little weight. I mean a lot of weight. And it's all right here in the middle. I mean, it ain't even spread out. It's all right here in the middle. And being a gentleman, you, you don't really want to say anything about it because, you know, you know, you notice things. But you, you don't say anything about it at first. But after a while, it will force some conversation. Baby, you're getting kind of thick in the middle. What's going on? Like, you know, like, what's happening? She said, Joey, I've been meaning to tell you. I got a circumstance that has come up. Circumstances? What you mean? And you're not going to believe this, Joey. I've been waiting on a good time to tell you. I didn't know how to tell you because I, I'm expecting. Who? Expecting? Expecting what? I'm expecting a baby. Yeah, but wait now. Don't get mad. Don't get this wrong. I ain't doing nothing wrong. Now, you ain't, you ain't going to believe this right here. It's the Lord's baby. Yeah, right. Joseph walked away from her and said, now I got to live with this. Everybody going to know about this. Have you ever loved and been angry at the same time? Ain't that a feeling? The kind of feeling where you feel like you want to put somebody down the steps, but you get down to the bottom to catch them before they get down to the end? But twixt in between, somebody said. So Joseph said, okay, you know what? I'm going to put her away privately. He said, I'm going to get out of this privately. In the Bible, you got to understand that an engagement was just like a marriage. Right. It required a bill of divorcement to get out of it. So he said, we're going to secretly go down to the lawyer and just sign the papers and we'll get out of this. And then when he's getting ready to go down and sign the papers to put her away, and she's distraught because she told him the truth, and he don't believe her. And you know what it's like to tell when someone, when you're telling somebody the truth and they don't really believe you. I told you, you, you didn't believe, you didn't listen to me, that, that's wrong. And the angel asked to come and speak to Joseph and said, fear not. That this man that in Mary is conceived by the Holy Ghost. Now he's really confused. Because now he's trying to believe something that common sense tell him ain't possible. His faith and his reasoning are now in conflict with one another. He has now told her that he's about to give her a bill of divorcement. I'm done. I can't deal with this. Now, God has said that she's telling the truth. Now, you have got to go back and tell somebody that you have already said, I don't believe you. Maybe you're right. And on top of all of this conflict that's going on, she's so upset. She has gone over to her cousin's house, who's been shut up for months because she's pregnant, too. Simply put, you know, you go into, I'm going back to my mama's house. You know, you know what I'm talking about. Then. Can you imagine what Joseph's friends must have been telling him? You ain't got to do this, man. Come on, bro. You ain't got to do this. Conflicted. Can you imagine what it would be like to be married and be telling somebody the truth and they don't believe you? And now they're trying to go along with it, but they already exposed the fact that they was going to get rid of you. How comfortable are you with somebody who's already told you they plan on getting rid of you? And here they are going down the road, trying to deal with this issue. And now on top of all of this, a new tax has come out. And in order to deal with this taxation, you got to go back to the city that the groom is from to pay the bill. Now we got a debt we wasn't expecting. We got a baby we show sure enough wasn't looking for. And we got a crisis that makes us look like a fool. And now we got to walk to Bethlehem. From Nazareth to Bethlehem, you're talking about about 90 miles that they had to walk. They're walking down there by foot with a pregnant woman in the middle of the east. No air conditioning, no fan, no music, no padded seats. She's pregnant on a donkey 
in the heat, traveling through the hot sands, inconvenience with somebody you at odds with on the day before your baby is going to arrive. And all in the back of her mind, she's hearing God say, Hail Mary, blessed art thou amongst women. You have found favor in the eyesight of God. I got a man that don't believe me. I got a donkey that's knocking me all over the place. My feet are swollen. I got a mask on my face. I got to stop ever so miles and throw up. I still got miles to get to my destination. My back hurt. My feet hurt. I'm about to go into labor. I don't have confidence because this guy has already told me he's going to get rid of me. And you're telling me I'm highly favored. She's already pregnant. And it's already hot. She's about to go into labor. The relationship is not going good. She's pregnant by the Lord. And you're trying to deal with all of this and be respectful and trying to believe that God somehow, some way, is in the midst of this situation. I wonder, church, have you ever had a situation and you was trying to believe God was in it? I mean, I mean, I mean, you know God must be up in there somewhere. I don't know where, I don't know how, I don't know what he's up to, but God has got to be in there somewhere. Hello, are you in there, God? Where are you? Can you hear me? It always looks like that the night before. God, where are you? Where, where are you? Hello. Job said, I looked to my right and he was not there. I looked to my left and I perceived him not. Have you ever looked for God in your situation and said, God, where are you? This is the worst time in the world for me to be dealing with this kind of mess. God, where are the promises? Where are the stuff that the preacher been preaching about? Where are the my seven steps for a turnaround? Where, where is my way to get out of this? And David had already warned us about this. David told you specifically that weeping may endure for a night. But oh, how we wish he would have told us how long the night was going to be. Lord have mercy. That, that's another thing I didn't picture right. I thought he was talking about talking to me and you about, you know, maybe six to eight hours or something like that. You know, the night time. But it's not that kind of night. He's talking about this a long night. This could be months and months and months of night. This can be in, in a hospital bed for months and months, nighttime. The night can be so long, you can lose your car and your house, almost lose your mind, and it's still nighttime. And he says, weeping may endure for a night. I can picture Joseph and Mary and a couple of goats and a chicken and a donkey traveling down the road. She had talking, he had talking, and now they finally got to a place to stay. And the innkeeper come out talking about, uh, I sure would like to help you. I really would love to help you, but I ain't got no room. Go on down the street about 90 more miles. And I got a friend of mine, I'm going to tell him I sent you. He'll be glad to give you a place to stay. Look, I've been walking. No, it, it's not that much further, but just, oh, I, I don't know, maybe, maybe a week down the road. And uh, to the left, there's another end there. And I know him, he'll give you a place to stay. If you just got here a little bit sooner, Amen. after about three or four rejected him, now he got to go back and say, look, Mary, I can't find no hotel. I don't know what we're going to do. The Best West in this book, the Quality Inn is book. Hey, even the Roach Motel is book. I can't even get in there. I don't, I don't know what we're going to do. And, 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 you, and, you know, and, and I'm looking at this, and, and you know, I would have think it amazed me because I'm, I'm, into, I'm into family structure. And, and I'm meant to how families operate and how they build off of each other. And I would think that the promised Messiah would have been born into a functional family. I would have thought that the promised Messiah would have been born into a family that didn't have any kind of issues. I would have thought that the Lord would have been in a functional, happy, robust, loving relationship. But the Lord picked a couple of folk who weren't even speaking to each other to bring the promised Messiah into the world. Can Christ be born into a dysfunctional family? Can Christ be born into a family that's backed up in payments to the IRS? 
And can he be born in a relationship where the communication has withered and is now non-existent? And can be born into a situation where the bills are high and can be born into a situation where the provisions are not what you wanted them to be? And he handpicked those circumstances. He handpicked them. Let, let's talk about where he could have been born. He could have been born in a cathedral. He could have been born in a synagogue. He could have been born in a manger. He could have been born to rich people. He could have been born with servants and maids and attendants. He could have had 10,000 angels to take care of him. But no, he was born without a physician, without a midwife, without a nanny, without a bottle. Without anything, he is born out there with nothing and nobody on a dirty, dusty road where either Joseph or Mary got to bend over and cut the cord. And he says, Jehovah Shammai. Jehovah Shammai means I am there. I am present. I am there. In the midst of trouble, God says, I'm right there with you. I'm not the kind of God oh, that just shows up when things are going well. But when all hell has broken loose in your life, I am still the same God that's going to be present in your situation. Child of God, don't you know, just like I did it the last time, I can do it for you again. And he says, he says, he says, I chose those situations. He said, I chose you, me? Yeah, I chose you. Me, yes, in your situation. Well, me and Fred ain't get along. I chose your situation. Well, I got trouble in my mind. I chose your situation. I chose you because I need somebody that's going to glorify my name. That's why I chose you. Because my strength is made perfect in weakness. I show off when all hell is broken loose in your life. My, but, but, and because I chose you, because I am not just the God of your today, I was the same God yesterday. I am not just a God of victory. I am a God of the battle that preceded it. Tell somebody he was the same God from yesterday. He was the same God from yesterday. He was the same God from the night before. And I find that anybody will get with you when it's morning time. Anybody will get with you when everything is right and everything is peaches and cream, everything is looking good. Anybody will be there when everything is going right. Anybody will show up when you get a breakthrough. Anybody will be there when you get blessed and they want to be a part of it. But I need a God that will walk down a dirty, dusty, lonely, frustrated, aggregated, irritated road just to find where I am. Weeping may endure for night. I just wonder what God got in store for us this morning. He says, he said, he said, weeping can only last for a night. But in the morning, joy is coming. And once again, Lord knows we would sure like to know how long the night is going to last. But I, but I, I want to tell, tell you something. I want to tell you something. All suffering that you experience is not an indication that you have sinned. All struggle that you go through in this life is not an indication that you have done something wrong. I want to tell you, child of God, that many a times you go through just because you can handle it. You go through just because God looks at your life and he sees that you are well capable of handling the trouble that he's going to send your way. Preacher, how do you know that? We look at the life of Job. Job. Oh, in that time, a person's wealth and what they owned and attained was measured by the amount of stuff that they owned. Job was the richest man in the East. Job had all of the cattle, all the camels, the donkey, anything you could want, Job had it. Job was so penitent and, rich and, and, and righteous in what he did that the scripture says that Job would rise up early in the morning as his children was out parlaying and partying all night. Maybe they had did something that they shouldn't have done and Job would rise up early in the morning to offer sacrifices and praises on behalf of his children. So here it is, you have a man that the scripture describes as perfect. Praying for his family. Had everything that he could ever want. And yet one day God suggests 
that he be considered. Yes, Satan from where's coming now? I've been walking to and fro, seeking whom I made the vow. Have you considered yes, my servant, servant Joe? What Joe did, nothing. <laughs> he was built for it. God said, I got one that ain't going to bow. I got one that you can't break. Well, he said, you know what? You know what? I tell you what. You know I can't do nothing with him because you got a hedge around him. Take that hedge from around him, and you know what? He'll curse you to your face. He'll doubt you. He'll curse you to his face. God took the hedge from around him. And imagine, this man is in a meeting, sitting down at the head talking to folk. And all the while, while you're sitting there, a messenger runs in. Hey! Some soldiers came in, stole all of your cattle, killed the men, and I alone am left to tell it. And while he's still speaking, another messenger runs in and says, hey, a strong wind came in from the east, and it knocked down the four pillars of the house that your children were partying in, and it killed everybody that was on the inside, and I alone am left to tell it. And as you're standing there, messenger after messenger is coming, is coming. Ain't life like that sometimes? Well, bad news here, bad news there. Bad news in the morning, bad news in the afternoon. Bad news in the afternoon, bad news in the evening. Coming back, repeatedly coming in. Job is stripped of everything that he has. All of his earthly possessions are taken away from him. But one thing he never lost was his praise. Job would lose something. And folk are looking at Job expecting him to give in and give out. And Job would say something like, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job would be going through and folk wonder how he holding on. He'll say, all the days of my appointed time, I will wait upon the Lord. I will wait until my change comes. Anybody believe in that on this morning? That no matter how long I have to go through, no matter how long I got to suffer, no matter how long I got to put up with this, I'm going to wait until my change comes. I'm not going to lose my praise. I'm not going to lose my joy. I'm not going to lose my confidence in God because I know in whom I have believed and I know in whom I have put my trust. Job said, though the Lord slay me, yet will I. I trust him. But Job, you ain't did nothing. I can understand if Job was out there doing everything that he was big and bad enough to do. I can understand if he was a compulsive liar. If he had murdered or done something wrong, but he had not done anything. He was built for it. So, so, so I, I wonder, maybe you're in that place this morning. And whether you want to admit it or not, you've questioned God before. Amen. I don't care how, how white your dress is and how black your suit is. We all going to come to a place in our life where we're going to be like, God, what's up? I'm faithful. I ain't all that I ought to be. But I'm trying. I'm putting my best foot forward. I'm doing everything that I know how to do. And yet still, I'm experiencing trouble. Look at the folk that don't even come to church. Look at the folk that don't even believe you're real. Look at the folk that crush you to your face, the folk that deny you. Look at them. It seems like they are experiencing the good things of life. And yet and still, here I am suffering. Here I am going through. You on the outside looking in. Because truth be told, folk would be surprised to know what you're dealing with this morning. Because you know what? When we come to church, you know what we do? And all I want you to see is my pretty smile. I want you to look at me and I want you to say, oh, they got it all together. Oh, everything is just going so right in their life. They're just doing so good. But if you could actually see the real individual, you see somebody that just wants to go into a corner, curl up in the fetal position, and bawl their eyes out because they just don't know how they're going to survive the trouble that they're dealing with. And let me tell you, it's easy to put on a mask. But let me tell you, it's something when you recognize that there's strength in your imperfection. 
that there's strength in your brokenness. And you bring your issues and you bring your brokenness to God and say, Lord, here I am. I am the clay. You are the potter. Put me on your wheel. Mold me, shape me, make me any way that you want me. And you got to understand that when you ask God to do that, you ask him for trouble. I have faith. How can faith be proven? It must be put to a test. When your faith is put to the test. So I got to ask you a question, just like Job. How do you respond when you are God's first round draft pick? How do you respond when you are the one that God looks at and say, it's time for you to be considered? How do you respond? And, and you ought not take it back because the simple reason, the very fact that God chooses you. Let's me know that God sees something on the inside of you that you don't necessarily see right now. Because he's already said in his word that I never put more on you than you're able to bear. So if I'm dealing with this issue, evidently I'm built to be able to handle it. But circumstances don't always make it look like that. Circumstances don't always make it look like that. I, I want to let y'all know if you haven't already, I'm sure you've experienced this before in your life already. Life will bring you to a point where you don't know what to do. Have, have, you, have you ever just been, just been sitting there and just been left like? Everybody that you know that might have been able to help you go in, they can't do anything for you. And you're left with the fact, like Paul said, I'm going to have to live off of the grace of God. Because there are a lot of things that we will encounter this life. It ain't going to be over with in a night. It ain't going to be over with in a day. Sometimes it's going to take a while for you to get out of some circumstances. But what is your response to God while you're dealing with your problem? Oh, some of us would have been like Job's wife. You are, why you still got your integrity? And you know she put that hand right here while she was talking to him. You know, you know why? Why you still got your integrity? Look at Job. Look, we ain't never had folk look at us like this. Now, don't, now his wife she re she receives a bad name, but if you were his wife, you would have been saying the same stuff. You always had. They never knew what it was to not have anything. Yeah. Everything always went your way. And then all of a sudden, everything is just taken away from you. I didn't marry you for this. I married you because you had money. Now look at you. I can't even stand and look at you. You got sores from the bottom of your feet to the top. What? what? Uh, uh, don't touch me. I don't want to be around you. Why, you still got your integrity. Why don't you just go ahead and curse God to his face. Just, just go ahead and get it over with. It's better for you to just go ahead and die for you to be able to deal with this. You, you talk like a foolish woman. Oh, and that just lets you know when you're going through your nice season, you better be careful about who around you. Come on, Come on now. When you're dealing with your struggle, when you're dealing with situation, you better be careful who's around you because you got some folk that like to see you going through. Yeah. And you really think they're there trying to be a benefit, trying to help you in your situation. They're really trying to keep you bound and trying to keep you out. And simply, and simply put, because we all simply sometimes got a crab in a bucket kind of mentality. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. What you trying to do? I ain't never did that. I've never gotten there. Why are you trying to get there? You trying to get ahead of me. Who you think you is? I'm a child of God. I'm a son of the king, heirs to the promise of God. You just don't know who I am. Curse God to his faith. Job said, all the days of my appointed time, he said, I'm going to wait on God. Yeah, yeah. Wait waiting, on waiting. Patience is a virtue. Mm -hmm. Something that we all got to be working towards. Yeah. Yeah. That's easier said than done. Yeah. Come on now. Because we all got a weight problem. Yes, sir. We all got a weight problem. Got a weight problem. Yes, sir. We all got, I ain't talking about weight. I'm talking about a weight problem. Yes, sir. We don't like to wait. We don't like to wait. Mm -hmm. We don't like to wait. We like everything to happen instantaneous for us at the moment 
right now. I want it my way, highway, Burger King. I want, I want to have it just like this right now, and I want it to happen this way. I want it to happen at this time. But the thing we got to understand, God don't work according to your plan and according to your schedule. Before you ever thought about a plan, God already had a plan for you. Before you ever thought about a way, God already had a way for you. So it would just make good sense to get in line with the plan of God and do what it is that God has commanded for you to do. But you got to realize, shout of God, that in the nighttime, he was the same God that he was yesterday. So we ought not get anxious and we ought not grow weary when we find ourselves stuck between a rock and a hard place. Because the same God that was good to you yesterday, he's going to be good to you today. The same God that was able to deliver you on yesterday, guess what? He'll deliver, he'll deliver you today. But your faith and your trust must be put in Jesus Christ. You got to believe in him. I ain't talking about half-hearted. I'm talking about you got to be sold out for God. My mind, my body, everything that I am is sold out for the use and the purpose of God. So therefore, when I'm going through, I, ain't, I have no need to worry. When I'm faced with trials and, and tribulation in my life, I have no need to fret. I have no need to hold my head down, feel down, trying, because I know in whom I have believed. Yeah. And I know in whom I have put my trust. And I know that he is able to deliver me yes, if I put my trust in him. How many of y'all going to wait on the Lord today? Amen. Wait on. He said, the scripture says, wait on the Lord and be of good courage. And he'll strengthen your heart. So even while you're going through night season, you got to learn how to wait. Yeah. Sometimes, Lord, it seems like we're just sitting at the bus stop of life. Every bus but ours coming by. Everybody else getting picked up but us. And we just sitting there looking at 13. No, that ain't 13. I'm still looking where that was coming. But you can sit there and wait. But you know, sooner or later, your bus is bound to pull up from somewhere. And we got to learn how to wait on God. God may not show up for me today, but guess what? I'm going to hold on tomorrow. He'll show up for me tomorrow. If God don't show up for me tomorrow, guess what? I'm going to still be holding on next week. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to get tired. I'm not going to give in. I'm going to wait on God. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Oh, that's why I come into the house of God with, my, with, with praise on my lip, because I need God to renew my strength. Because after I've been through a week of the devil beating me all up inside my head, kicking me in my back, punching me in my stomach, it seemed like every turn I turn around, the devil is at me. I need God to renew my strength. Amen. Amen. And if I wait on him, the scripture says that he'll renew my strength. And after he's renewed me, I'll be able to mount up with wings like an eagle. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. And take flight. Yes, sir. God is waiting on you this morning. He's waiting on you. He's waiting on you to try him. If you ain't never tried God, you ought to try him today. Amen. Somebody, somebody said, how will I know that Sister Coffee can make some bad oxtails? You got to taste them. <laughs> and it is after you have tasted and seen for yourself. I don't care what nobody come along and say, you can't tell me she ain't cooking no oxtail because I've tasted them for myself. And I know what they're about. And once you have been around the road and back with God, and you've seen God deliver, you've seen God make a way, can't nobody put no doubt in your mind about no, God and what no. God is able to do. Can't nobody come along and tell you, you know, you're a Hebrew Israelite and you are all of this and that. And can't nobody come along with a bean pie and a bow tie. As-salamu alaykum, as alaykum, salam, uh, in the name of Allah, the be never. Can't nobody come along and tell you all of that because you know for yourself. What God is able to do. I don't know about you, but when I find myself between a rock and a hard place, Confucius can't do nothing for me. Amen. Buddha can't do nothing for me. Not, Muhammad can't do nothing for me. I call on the name of Jesus. And my Bible says it is at that name that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God. And let me tell you, if you try you will have made the best decision 
that you can ever make in your life. And I can tell you, and everybody else in here that has ever made that decision can tell you, since when I chose Jesus, I made the best decision that I could have ever made in my life. It does not mean that life will be easy by a long shot. And that's where you're getting messed up. And that's why we find it hard to believe that God is with us in certain situations because we believe somehow that as children of God, we're not supposed to suffer. We're not supposed to go through. We're not supposed to go through any type of affliction. That when you became a child of God, that spiritually, when you came out of the water, that God wrapped you and your feelings up in cotton. So when you fall and when you get hit, you'll never get hurt. But this is what he did say. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord shall deliver them out of them all. So I can expect to experience persecution in this life. I can expect to go through night seasons, but I can also expect that just like I went through, yes, sir. I'm going to come out yes, sir. because my God has already promised that he will deliver me yeah. Yeah. and he'll deliver yeah. me right on time. Yeah. Amen. If you are here, child of God, on this morning, and you find yourself in a place on this morning where you just like, God, where are you? When are you going to show up? How long is this going to last? How long am I going to have to put up with this? We want to pray for you this morning. Because let me tell you, sometimes when you're going through, you know, you know what it's like to go through a night season and feel like you ain't got nobody that you can depend on? To go through troubled times in your life and feel like you ain't got nobody that you can call, nobody that you can depend on, because should be told, you wonder about how they're going to feel about you yeah, yeah. if you really told them about the stuff that you're dealing with. You wonder how they're going to react if they really knew the struggles and the pains that you're having to go through. But I know a man that you can take your burdens to and you can leave them there. And you can trust him to take care of what you think is impossible. He is an on time God. He is a mighty God. He's sovereign in what he does from beginning to end. Alpha and Omega from the start to the finish. My God is the same. Yesterday. He was the same God yesterday. So therefore I can depend on him today. And if you're going through the day, you can depend on him. To bring you out of whatever it is that you're dealing with yeah. on this morning. So we want to pray for you this morning if you're standing in the need of prayer. If you are not a child of God this morning, you find yourself outside of the ark of safety. You have not yet had your sins washed away by the blood of the Son of God. You yourself are in spiritual trouble on this morning. And it is not by accident that God permitted you to be in this place on this morning. But I do believe with all my heart that it was divinely orchestrated by God that you be here this morning because God has something that he wanted you to hear that was going to be of some benefit unto your life. So if you're here this morning and you are not a Christian, you're standing outside of the ark of safety. I want to be a person to tell you scripturally what it is that you must do to be saved, because I'm going to tell you, you can come here and we're going to tell you a way by which you must be saved. You go across town or somewhere. They're going to tell you a way by which you must be saved. You go down the road just a little bit further along the way. They're going to tell you a way by which you must be saved. But I'm not too much concerned by anything that a man has to say Come as on. it pertains to my soul's salvation. I'm concerned with what it is that the word has to say That's about right. my soul's salvation. Because my Bible says that heaven and earth shall pass away. But it is the word of the Lord that shall stand forever. And in reading the scripture, in reading the word of God, I find out that God, that the church was not an afterthought of God but that the church was God's first thought that the church was on God's mind before the foundation of the world that before God ever made Adam and Eve he already had the church in his mind and I'm so glad that the body of Christ that the church is not an exclusive unit but it's an inclusive unit that is not just for the Jews but it's for the Gentiles as well it's for anybody that would come to God with a repentant heart and say father I need this you are welcome to come into the body of Christ y'all 
y'all recall when Peter was out there on the coast of Caesarea Philippi, standing in the face of all of those idol gods, and here it was at this time, Jesus had not yet revealed who he was. And coming upon them, he said, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? He said, some say that thou art Elias, or others Jeremiah, or John the Baptist, or one of the other Old Testament prophets. He said, okay, I hear all of that. He said, but whom do you say that I, the son of man, am? Peter looked at him, he said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus looked at him in bewilderment and said, blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven, and I say to you that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Plural, church, my church. My is a possessive pronoun that shows ownership, am I right about it? My church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, and I will give you the keys to the kingdom, and whatever you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven, and whatever thou bound on earth, I'll bound in heaven. What you giving, what you giving a man keys for? He been the driveway going. He used those keys on the day of Pentecost. When the first church service was here, the Bible says that you had all devout Jews from every nation. You had Parthians, you had Medes, you had Eliamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, Cappadocia, and Asia. They were dwelling that together. Came a sound as of a mighty Russian wind, filled the place where they were sitting, sat upon them, cloven tongues like it under fire. Here it is. Somebody said, these folk must be drunk. He said, these are not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which was prophesied by the prophet Joel, that in the last days I pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see this. All of this was prophesied before time. And here it is as Peter began to preach the word of God to them, and he told them about how it was that they had crucified the Lord of the world, how they had with, with wicked hands had crucified our Lord and Jesus Christ, our Savior. And by the words that Peter preached unto them, the scripture said that they were pricked unto their heart and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Now that just lets me know that if you want to be saved, there's something that you got to do. Because people today will tell you that you're already saved because of what Jesus did on the cross. But if I tell you that I'm going to give you a million dollars, you just got to come get it. You're going to get the million dollars, but there's an action that must be taken on your place for you to come and for you to attain it. So here it is. When Peter got through preaching to them, the Bible said that they were pricked to the heart and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter's response was, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All right. Okay. So you mean to tell me is that easy? Yeah. It is simply put in the word of God what it is you must do to be saved. A sinner's prayer sounds good, don't it? But there's a very important part of it that's missing, and that is water. I can talk about taking a bath all day, but I need to get in the bath for an effect to take place on my body. I, am I right about it? I, only the blood of Jesus is able to wash away your sins. Despite popular belief, you cannot go into a, a cathedral somewhere and sit on the other side of a screen and say, Father, I've done X, Y, and Z. I've done this. What is it that I must do for my sins to be forgiven? And he tell you to go home and say about five or six Hail Marys and you will be all right. But, but, but despite popular belief, that is not going to get your sins washed away. That is not going to get your sins forgiven. You must come in contact with the blood of Jesus. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And it is the blood that will wash away your sins. So just as Christ was lowered into the earth, so we too are lowered down to ourselves. And as we are in the water, we die to death. And when we rise up, just as Christ was raised, we rise up to walk in the newness of life. Scripture says that all things are what? Behold, all things shall be made new. Your life can be made new this morning. Things can be made different in your life if you will make the step, if you will make the choice to say yes to Jesus. Yes to your will. Yes to your way. Lord, I'm willing to obey what it is that you have commanded for me to do. So if you stand in the need of salvation this morning, come by hearing this word. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse number 17. So then faith come by hearing. And hearing by the word of God, after hearing you must believe, he said, except you believe that I am he, 
you shall die in your sins. After belief, you repent. What is repent? Repentance is a change in my mind that produces a change in my action. And I didn't just go down a dry devil and come up a wet devil, but there's a change that is taking place in my life. And after repentance, you confess with your mouth the sweetest name known to mortal tongue, and that is that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. And after confession, you are willing then to be baptized for the remission of your sin, have your sins washed away, eradicated, done away with, never to come up before you in this life and neither the life that is to come. And according to Acts chapter 2 and verse number 47, praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord himself added to the church daily such as should be saved. So my brother and my sister, don't put off today for what you plan on doing tomorrow. Today is the best day for you to make the choice to say, Lord, I'm going to follow you. Lord, I'm leaving everything behind to follow Jesus and to surrender to his will and to his way. And if you are here this morning and you desire salvation, you desire prayer, come to Jesus now while together we stand and sing the song of invitation.